know if you caught in there the words that you were meant to change the world. And I don't know if as you read those words and as you heard that this morning, how you felt about that. I wonder if you had a voice go through your head that said, no, I can't. That's a silly statement. Or, did you think, yes, I can. I'm going to try this morning to make you a believer in your ability and really more clearly in God's ability through you to change the world. I think this is my microphone doing this again. I think it's, if I just don't move my head and if I don't walk anywhere, I think I'll be okay. I'll go ahead and try this one here. Okay. From the beginning of time, as we open up our Bible and, and we read from Genesis, we read of, of what? We read of creation. From the very beginning of time, God has been writing a story. And God's story begins with him creating all things and creating man and creating woman. And in this story, there's a, a major twist in Genesis 3 as sin enters our world and our relationship with God is broken. It changes our relationship with God. We're separated from him and death enters our world because of sin. And then we read this incredible, passionate love story of a God who loves his creation, his created beings, this man and this woman so much that he begins to gather a people. He calls them Israel. And he gives this, this man, Abraham, descendants that becomes this nation. And from this nation of Israel comes this man named Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who is God incarnate, God in the flesh. God came to earth, the one who made all things, became man and walked on this earth. And he gathered these people. They were called disciples. He gathered these people. And they followed with him. He led them. He guided them. And Jesus died on a cross. He suffered. He bled. He was beaten. He was spit upon. The God who made everything, who became man and humbled himself, even to the amount of becoming a man, endured suffering and pain, incredible torture. And he died. He endured this punishment for our sin. There wasn't sin part of his life. There was sin part of our life. And he endured the punishment for that sin by hanging on the cross for us. Praise God our gracious, loving, and powerful God who endured the pain and suffering that we deserve for our sin so that we can now put our faith and our life in him, in Jesus Christ, have salvation and have redemption. You see, God has been telling this story from the beginning of time. And as we looked at last week, we believe God is continuing to tell this story through Northern Hills Church. See, this story doesn't have an end. It doesn't have a conclusion. It's continuing to play out in this world. And last week, we discussed why we planted a church. And it's for really no other reason other than we believe God is continuing this story, just like he's done for thousands of years as he's, he's placed in the hearts of his people this desire to grow his kingdom, to reach further, to gather more and more people into his kingdom, to experience this love and this redemption. That's why we planted a church. And this is really important for us to revisit. It's really important for us to think about. Because everything we do as a church family, everything we do as an individual Christian is influenced by this. You see, when we think about why we're doing things, it's easy for me to think, why am I writing a sermon this morning? Am I writing a sermon this morning so that I can fill our service with that time slot? Are we preparing some music this morning so we can have good music that everyone will love and everyone will enjoy? And are we going to do the sound in order to have everyone 
have all of our microphones working and have everything go perfectly and have everybody leaving here thinking this morning, oh, what a great experience it was that I had there. You see, this isn't why we're doing these things. We're not here this morning so that we can have an amazing experience. We pray and we hope that this is a great experience, an encouraging and an uplifting one. But that's not why we're doing this. We're doing this because this is a small piece, very important, but a small piece to what God is doing through our church and helping to fulfill his mission of reaching a lost world and drawing them back into relationship with him. Everything that we're doing has this purpose, and it contributes to this incredible, great purpose that God has. This morning, I want to share with you and move forward to where we're going as a church. So we know why we're doing this. We know what this is all about. But where is it we're going? I don't know if you remember being a child. I barely do. Not because I'm old, because I have a terrible memory. But I do remember some experiences. And I think it's strange at this point in my life to even remember any experience that I ever had when I was traveling somewhere and didn't know where I was going. And that's because I cannot hardly stand to not know where I'm going. If I'm going on a trip, let alone be the one who's actually taking us there. Sitting in the backseat of a vehicle is one of the more difficult things that for me to endure right now in my life. But as adults, we never go on a trip without knowing what our destination is, do we? at least very seldom. But if you can just take yourself back to that time when you were a child and how often you just naively jumped in a vehicle and most often didn't have a clue where you're going. And if you knew where you were going, you had no idea how you were going to get there. I remember thinking as a kid, driving down a street in Salmon Arm, British Columbia, where we lived, as it's one of these really strange, vivid memories that I have, I remember being amazed at my father because he always knew how to get places. And I thought, this city is the biggest maze in the world. How could he possibly remember how to go to all of these places? What an amazing man my father was. Of course, now I've learned that the places we were going were about five blocks away. But in my child's view, it was amazing. And I had no concept of where I was going. I find that relationships are often this way. You know, I'm not entering into relationships very often anymore. But how often, especially when we were young, say we were in high school, and many of our kids are experiencing this right now, going to a new school, and you begin to meet people, and you begin to wonder, where is this relationship going? Where is it headed? And often I find that I've found that my best friends in life I've never had an intention or a purpose to it. I've never known where that was headed. But somehow over a period of years, I've become closest friends with people. Sometimes in in relationships, very often, it's hard to know where they're going. There's actually a similar scene that we've probably all seen on television in, in lots of movies and television shows, and that is this scene where somebody is abducted. Unfortunately, for some reason, they find the need to put that into TV all the time, along with a lot of other completely necessary things. But we've seen this scene where somebody is abducted, and and what always happens is somebody comes up behind this person and has some sort of a a pillowcase or a a bag, and they throw this over the person's head, and they throw throw them quickly into a vehicle, right? And then, boom, within a second, all of a sudden, they're gone, and nobody nobody saw it now on the street, right? And then we see the, the, the image of them stuck either in a trunk of a car or in a van with some bag over their head, and they don't know where they're going. They're being taken somewhere. And I always thought, man, what would be a terrifying feeling to have, wouldn't it be, to have that happen to you? And then to just be in this vehicle, not able to see where you're going, to not have any idea who has you even. But I want to ask you this morning, if your life ever feels like that, on a deeper level now to consider as you're living your life, you're making life choices. You're choosing where to work, where you're going to live, where your kids are going to go to school, 
who you're going to actually be in relationship with and, and have friends? Does your life ever feel like it doesn't have any direction, like you're aimless, you're wandering? I think a lot of us struggle with that quite often. And now again, let's move on to does your faith ever feel this way? Do you ever feel in your life of faith like you're lost and you don't know where it is that you need to go? It's very easy for us to feel this way, not only with our life, but with our faith. And that's why this morning I want to share this with you. And this is a really simple message that I'm going to have. And I'm not going to actually, I I won't say I'm not going to talk very long after this because I definitely will. (laughs) And I'll hear it from all of you after. But but this is a really simple and a really clear message about where we're going this morning. You see, I believe that God has a very clear purpose, a very clear direction, not just for you or for me as individual people, but for his church in this world. God has a clear direction and purpose for us, and that our lives should never feel, our faith should never feel, and church should never feel like we're aimless, and we're wandering, and we don't know where we're going. We want to have a clear direction, a clear destination, and to know where it is we're headed as a church. So let's open up our Bibles to Matthew 28. Right to the very end of the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, and before we actually read through this scripture... Let me just share with you the context of this passage because this is an incredibly important passage to us, to all those who claim faith in Jesus Christ, who live for Jesus, who desire his will, who desire his purpose for their lives. This is an incredibly significant passage, and it's significant for two reasons. We'll look at one before we even read it. It's because of its place. In scripture. And so before we read this, I want to acknowledge the place of this passage. And as I already shared with you this morning, this, this chapter of God's story as Jesus gathered these men called disciples, and for years they followed him, and he taught them, and he modeled for them, and he displayed his desire for them by being with them. This story comes after the death of Jesus that I've shared this morning. See, I proclaimed this morning that Jesus died for our sins, that he literally suffered and died on a cross and was dead. What I didn't acknowledge was that he also rose again and was fully alive again, and he walked and he ate with his disciples again after his death. And I know you've heard that before, but please consider the significance of that statement. He, Jesus rose from the dead, and this passage comes following his resurrection from the dead. It also is just prior to him now leaving his disciples and his followers. And if you consider what I've just shared with you, that Jesus spent these years with these men, discipling these men, and and he is now about to leave these men. He called his disciples. He has a message for them. And so it's significant because this is his final message to his disciples before he leaves. Consider what Jesus came to do. Consider what's now happened because of Jesus Christ throughout the world. You know, we have the incredible benefit of looking past through thousands of years of history to see how this world is a completely different place because of one man named Jesus Christ. Consider the significance of what Jesus came to do. He's about to leave earth. He's about to leave these disciples and leave this in, his, in their hands. And this is his message to them. It's significant. We'll read through this, and then I want to point out the other reason why this is incredibly significant for us, and it deserves our attention this morning. So it's starting in verse 18 of Matthew 28. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so he, he has a, a prelude to this passage, to his message, by stating that he has all authority in heaven and on earth. And then in verse 19, he says, therefore, because of this authority that I have on earth, this is my message for you. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This passage is known as the Great Commission. It's known as the Great Commission reason. 
It's because of the significance of this passage to our faith and to our life as we live it for God. And so Jesus here shares with us his desire for us. He shares with us where it is he wants his disciples, these followers, to go. He gives his people, his church, a direction in this passage. The second reason this passage is so significant, I don't know if you noticed the, the verbs, the action words that are included in this passage. It's very helpful as you are considering your faith and your life lived for God, and you consider where is it I'm headed. More importantly, where is it we are headed as a church? Not just Northern Hills Church, but our church, the church, God's church in this world, the global church. What is God's desire for his church? You see, he has words like go, make, baptize, teach. There's some very clear direction included in this passage. And there is an action, a request for action in Matthew 18, 28 verses 18 to 20. And as he begins and he says, go, I believe that is one of the most significant of his requests of his disciples, is to go. And as you go, in fact, the, the literal translation of this can be translated and is sometimes translated, and it's probably more accurately translated as, as you go. Not, not go. It's not a command. It's as you go. It's an assumption that you are now my disciples. You're going to go. And as you go, make disciples of all nations and baptize them and teach them everything I've commanded you. And thank goodness he will always be with us to the very end of the age. Might be a silly question to ask some of you this morning, but I do want to ask it anyway. And that is, are you, are you a disciple? Have you ever considered whether or not you are a disciple of Christ? You see, Jesus gathered these men. They were called disciples. And it's easy to look at these men as these incredible biblical men who fulfilled God's desires and who were filled with the Spirit doing incredible things. It's another thing to look at a mirror and look at yourself and say, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. But this morning, I want to share with you that if you, if you believe in Jesus Christ and put your faith in Jesus Christ, that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, the word Christian, follower of Christ, is very same as saying I'm a, a disciple of Christ. Are you a disciple? And therefore, if you are a disciple, are you going? Are you making? Are you baptizing? Are you teaching? Because this is the desire of God that we hear from Jesus in Matthew 28. So let me move on. I want to share with you our mission as a church, which is kind of silly because it's on a banner and you've already seen it this morning. But let me expand upon it and let me, for all of our sake, let's just look at, at this a little bit deeper. What is our mission as a church? Our, our mission as a church is to be living and leading toward God. Well, what does that look like? What does that actually mean? You see, we didn't want to just start a service. We didn't just want to start small groups. We didn't want to just plan activities or events for fun, to have social uh, events and activities for, for people. We didn't want to just, in starting a church, do things that churches do and have always done for the sake of doing that because that's what churches have done. We wanted to have purpose. We wanted to have direction. And so the reason we've come up with and we have now come together as a church family, and we actually are participating in all of these things as a church family, is because of our mission of living and leading towards God. What does this mean? Really, the big dream behind Northern Hills Church, our desire where we're headed is to be a transformed and a transforming community of redeemed sinners, living our lives on a path toward God and leading others on a path toward God. So there's two components to this. You see, we desire to be a church so that we as followers of Jesus Christ can grow in our relationship with God, can become closer and closer in our relationship with God, growing in wisdom and stature 
And as well, as it's God's desire for us as a church, as it's our mission as a church, we want to lead others on a path toward God. And what, is this, what does this look like? That's a little bit vague. I want to share with you a little bit about what this looks like. And I realize for, for many of us this morning, and I really hope for many of us this morning, there's, in fact, for, really for anybody, when we're talking about something like our spirituality, our faith, there should be a complexity to that. Something that, whereas if you're trying to put that into words to define that, it should be really difficult to define that, what it, what it means to be a disciple, what it means to actually live my life on a path toward God or to lead somebody else on a path toward God. This is something that's really difficult to put into words and to describe. But we've gone ahead and tried anyway in our church. And before I share this, I just want to say that for all of those who feel like my journey toward God is much more complex, in fact, the journey for most people is likely far more uh, complex and, and complicated than that. I agree with you, and it is, but we've, we've attempted to because this is, this is a difficult thing for all of us, uh, not only to actually consider our life and how we can grow closer to God, but as we consider how we can be a disciple maker, how we can fulfill this great commission of going toward people and drawing people into the redemption that's found in Jesus. It's, it's really easy and it's very common for each of us to ask the question, how? How do I do that? What does that look like? And so what we've tried to do is paint a simple picture for people. And this is only in order to aid and to help. It's not a clear definition and does include everything. And so in our church, what we've defined and what we've laid out are four different areas. I actually forgot to grab a connection card, but if you've seen one of our connection cards in your chair this morning, you'll see four different areas of either being connected or involved or serving or in ministry at our church. And it's called, they're called Connect, Grow, Serve, and Multiply. These are the four areas we want to lead people towards. We want to encourage people towards is connecting, growing, serving, and multiplying. We believe that most areas of, of fulfilling our mission as, as a church, of actually going and making more disciples, as Jesus desires us to do, of growing our own lives, of, of becoming closer and closer to God, and growing others closer to God, that these four areas are very key. They're essential, and without them, we're not going to be able to be effective in doing this as a church. And so how are we going to do this? As I ask how I can grow my relationship with God, I must ask myself, am I connected? Am I connected in a relationship with God am I, to my church? We must ask ourselves the question, am I growing? Am I growing not only in wisdom, but in practice? Is my life becoming more and more filled by God and his desires of me? We must be asking ourselves the question, if we're to be disciples, fulfilling our mission as a church, am I serving, not just in my church family, but am I serving the world around me, my loving and caring for all those God places in my life, as Phil mentioned, whether it's a guy cutting you off on Deerfoot, or whether it's a guy at work who makes it unbearable for you at work, whether it's the person who you heard about this past week who is incredible pain and suffering or is feeling lost and alone, or am I caring for, am I serving and loving those around me, and am I multiplying, am I multiplying myself? And others. Let me talk about multiplication and multiplying a little bit more and expand upon that. See, if we ask ourselves the question, well, what is success? How do we know if we're being successful at accomplishing this mission of living and leading toward God? See, multi multiplication is important and it's essential. Our goal is not to simply add people to our number. Our goal is to multiply ourselves in others, just as Jesus did as he gathered these men. And they, they walked with him, and he taught them, and he modeled for them his life. Jesus multiplied himself in these disciples. And as we read the incredible stories in Acts of the Apostle Paul planting churches and meeting people like Silas and Timothy and all these incredible followers of Christ, these were regular people that were gathered by the disciples of Jesus, and they became disciples of Jesus. And they went out, and they went, they, they went as Jesus called them, go. They went, and they...
actually multiplied more and more disciples of Jesus. These regular, average people actually became disciples of Christ who were making other disciples, and that's our desire as a church. So your desire is not to gather a number of people and to add a number of people, but our desire is to multiply ourselves and others. Is to make the ways in which Jesus has transformed our life and changed my heart. You see, I've, I shared my story with you last week. If my direction at one point in my life about 12 years ago was this way, God took it and he turned it, and it's now going this way. So my desire as I look at being a disciple of Jesus, it includes connecting with other people, being in relationship with those people, and attempting to multiply what God has done in my life and help and guide them towards having that place in their life. And that is what all of us are called to as disciples of Jesus. And lastly, the results. This is what I began with this morning. We do have the ability to change our world. And whether or not you actually look at yourself in the mirror and you think, no, I can't. There is no way. Let me first actually say I agree with you. You can't. (laughs) You probably can't. It's a really big world. And almost everybody in this world is incredibly stubborn and set in their ways and has already decided what they believe. They've already decided a direction for their life. And so who are you and who am I to think there is any way possible to ever change that, to turn that direction? I don't believe I'm capable of doing that. I believe I'm a great arguer and debater. I'm a great at manipulating. I learned that craft as a child. But it doesn't matter how good I am at any of those things. It doesn't matter how good any of you are at any of those things. We don't have the ability to place faith in somebody's heart. You see, God places faith in people's heart. His Holy Spirit enters the life of people, enters their heart, and transformation begins to take place. But what he does do and what he's done throughout history, what he's been doing in the last few months as we've been a church family, is he enters the lives of people around us and he prepares them for us to enter their life in some way. And whatever he's gifted each of us with, I know for a fact he has gifted each of us, each of you, with a way in which you can disciple someone, in a way in which you can connect with somebody, and you can be part of that life transformation that takes place. It only happens through the power of God's Spirit in people's hearts. We cannot place faith into someone's heart. We cannot argue somebody towards Jesus Christ. You know what we can do, though, is we can love people towards Jesus. We can display this incredible love that's now part of our life. We can share with people the transformation, the change, and the change of direction that's happened in our heart and what our desire is for our life. And we can pray that God does the same for them. And guys, I don't know if we're going to change the world as a church, but let me tell you this, I know we can. I don't know, I had you think about being a kid earlier. It's something I was thinking about before I decided to take on a great responsibility in being part of this church plant. And something I was thinking about again this past week is uh, I I have the privilege of having kids in my life. And if you've had this privilege, or if you've had the privilege of being a child once, which I'm pretty sure we all have, I have this incredible experience lately with my four-year-old son, Ezra, where it doesn't really matter what's going on. As long as I'm there, he is not afraid. It actually makes me afraid that he's not afraid. And so it doesn't matter what step he's on on the stairs. He'll yell, Dad, catch me, and he'll fly. And I better be ready to catch him. This summer we were swimming in a lake, and he would not go into the water off of this dock until his dad was there holding his hand, jumping in with him. And for some reason, it was all good and all safe then. 
You see, for a young child, as they look at their father or their mother, they see in them invincibility. They're capable of anything, and they know everything. I thought my dad was so amazing for knowing where to go. Well, consider this for a moment. My prayer this morning and my hope this morning is that each of us can bring ourselves back to this place of being an innocent child looking at our Father. And who is our Father? Our Father in heaven. And in case we don't know, let's, let's consider for a fact who this Father in heaven is. This one who actually, we're, he's, he's, he's the one guiding and he's the one leading us. He's the one that's giving us our direction. This is his mission, it's not ours. We have the privilege and the gift of being a part of it. How incredible is that? But this is the God who made all things. He breathed everything into existence. He created life. Everything that we've ever known or seen, everything we could possibly imagine, and so much more, this God has the power to create all of that with his, just by breathing it into existence. He's the one that's created the incredible intricate detail of every single one of your fingerprints that's different than every other one of the seven billion people on earth. And he knows you, every hair on your head. How incredible is this? This powerful, amazing God you see. Our Father in heaven is capable of anything. There is nothing that can stand in his way other than our fear and our inability to put our faith in him. May we be like children, putting our faith in this infinitely powerful, incredibly gracious God, leading us towards his mission of being disciples who are making disciples. If you'll bow with me, I want to conclude our service this morning, and I'll leave time for you to also just quietly be in reflection and prayer uh, before we close our service. But let's just go to God and let's pray this morning. I just ask of you, will you pray with me and let's join together, unify our hearts in prayer towards God, that he can create in us and he can do what he needs to do in our church family. God, we, we lift you on high. God, we lift you above all things. Lord, you reign over this earth. In a world where it's incredibly difficult to see that. God, we know that you have control over all things, that you have power over all things. And as we gather here this morning, as your church family, humbly, broken people, God, there's, there's really nothing to make us believe we're capable of hardly anything apart from you. And so we're drawn to you, Lord. We come to you. God, we just want to bring our hearts closer to you right now. And God, I just pray that you'll hear the aches and the groans that are on our hearts right now. God, we're all such a different people in different places. So, Lord, my prayer is you will bring us closer to one another in order that we might become closer to you. God, I pray you unify our hearts. Help the many different various ways our lives are completely different from one another add and contribute to a beautiful painting and picture that you're creating in Northern Hills Church, Lord. God, our prayer this morning is you'll guide us forward. You'll lead us. God, when we take our own direction, please put up some sort of barricade. Stop us from going in that direction, Lord. We pray for your direction. Lord, we seek your guidance. We surrender ourselves to you. All that we are, Lord, we surrender to you. Even today, Lord, Guide us closer. Help us to guide others closer to you through your son, Jesus.
Amen.